right, we are uh, returning to H107. Um, Ron's going to hook us up with a phone interview with Ray Pepin from Rhode Island, who is the uh, temporary disability insurance administrator. We talked to him two years ago, I believe, in this committee. Rhode Island is one of the few states that has had an active temporary disability insurance program. They've had it since about, well, Ray will give us the information, but basically since the 1940s. Um, very quickly, if we could just introduce people around the table. Um, and I don't, I don't think we need to introduce ourselves individually to Ray, so if we could introduce ourselves here. And then I'd just like to also you know, hear from folks who are, who are here in the room as well. Um, I'm Representative Tom Stevens from Waterbury. I'm Representative <coughs> Deanna Gonzalez from Winooski. Representative Matt Byron, Virgens. Randall Zott, Barnard. Representative Mariana Gamash from Swanton. John Kalaki from South Burlington. Tommy Waltz from Berry City. Chip Troyano from Stanford. And Representative Howard um, is having surgery today or yesterday. <coughs> she fell and hurt her arm. Oh, man. Um, and we have a vacancy. And Representative Long may join us. She is the um, House. A majority whip, so she's in and out of committee. Um, who else is here for today? David Van Dusen, for a union rep for AFSCME. We're here because we very much support um, paid family medical leave. Hi, I'm Julia Rogers. I am a, in the Snelling Center for Government's Vermont Leadership Institute class this year, and I'm also on the board of Main Street Alliance. I'm Dennis Labounty. I'm in the Vermont AFL-CIO. Charles Martin with the Vermont Chamber. I'm Ashley Moore with the Main Street Alliance. Tess Kennedy with Shield Dyson Associates on behalf of a variety of clients. Jill Rickard with the Department of Financial Regulation. Will Beacom with Downs Rockland London. Kelly Alt with the Vermont Early Childhood Advocacy Alliance. Ginger Irish also with the Snelling Center for Leadership. Right. And Susan Bettman from Torca Media. Great. Um, so as Ron's dialing, I uh, just uh, we're picking up where we're going to find out uh, this the H107 has a proposal in it where uh, a portion of the 12 weeks can be used for personal disability um, which is a concept that did not get included in last year's version of the bill in the end um, this is a new this would be a new idea for Vermont but it's also um, something that I think what we'll hear from Rhode Island and perhaps other states is that they've been able to manage this bill or this concept, um, and we can ask the questions about bankruptcy, solvency, et cetera, um, and how the program has worked over the years. Uh, good afternoon, is this Ray Pepin? Yes, hello. Hi, this is Representative Tom Stevens, Chair of the House General Housing and Military Affairs Committee. How are you? Good. Good afternoon. Um, Ray, we talked to you a couple of years ago on, a, on this very same issue. Um, Vermont is considering a paid family leave program that considers, um, that considers adding this temporary disability insurance to our paid family leave program and Rhode Island has had it for quite some time and so we were we were going to just sort of ask you what the experience has been for Rhode Island how it's set up how it's how much it costs um, and how it's managed to last since the 1940s okay yeah I'll do my best I, I do recall testifying I didn't know if it was last year I, from what you say it sounds like it was more than uh, it was two year. two years ago about this time yeah okay So it's all yours. We, we've got a room full of people and a committee here um, who may ask questions throughout the, throughout the interview, but I'll try to manage that on this end. Okay, very good. Uh, obviously, I can tell you're on a speaker, so I may have to have you repeat some things, particularly if they're from people further away, but uh, we'll get through it. Thank you. So we're ready when you are. I'm ready anytime. I'm yeah, just so, so how, what is Rhode Island's program? And I'm sorry, what about Rhode Island's program? Exactly. What is, how does Rhode Island's program work uh, for, for an employer and an employee? Okay, so Rhode Island's uh, uh, temporary disability insurance program uh, is the first uh, state in the country to have it. It started in 1942. Um, 
It is 100% employee finance. The taxes are on the employee. There is no tax to the employer in the Rhode Island plan. Um, so uh, that keeps the employers happy, obviously. So um, that's, the, that's one of the big things. We've been doing it, like I said, since 1942. Uh, it provides uh, a percentage of the of wage replacement income for someone for their own illness. Uh, then in 2014, the Act, the Temporary Disability Act, was amended to create two more qualifying reasons to collect TDI, uh, we added uh, caring for an ill relative or bonding with a new child as reasons to collect temporary disability insurance aside from your own illness. And for those two new reasons, uh, it's capped at four weeks. You can only receive four weeks of TDI uh, for the TCI purposes. And that's not four weeks per event, that's four weeks total in a claim year for any and all TCI reasons. Um, you guys, it uh, sounds like you're calling call it paid family leave or something like that. But we, if I say TCI, that would kind of be what you're talking about in the paid family leave portion. And TCI, uh, we do not have them as separate programs. Uh, when you qualify, you're given a maximum entitlement of TDI that you can receive in a claim year, um, and that's for any and all illnesses or filings for the TCI benefit. So it's a max four weeks, whether it's for an individual's personal health or care for an elder or child? Right, right. In other words, say uh, you were, uh, and that's an acclaim here, but that has nothing to do with your, you know, it, it, it comes out of your TDI balance, so to speak, because it's not a separate program, but it's not per event. You can't say care for your ill wife right now and a few months from now on with a new child, you would have probably already exhausted your four weeks caring for your wife, if you know what I mean. And, and so what about the amount of TDI when you say it comes out of our account? Like how many how many weeks of TDI can... Well, the maximum anyone could possibly get on TDI in a claim year would be 30, um, but uh, the, uh, of which four of those you could use for TCI purposes. Uh, obviously, most uh, people don't qualify for the maximum 30 weeks. Uh, that's all based on your earnings, and I don't want to get too inside baseball on you. Um, that's all on our website on how we calculate things. But any individual filing, um, the, the average last year, I'm looking at 2017, we don't have the numbers in finalized for 2018 quite yet, but in 2017, the average TDI claim was about 13 weeks. And so what does it cost the employee? Okay, so uh, the cost of the employee currently is 1.1% of the first $71,000 they earn. And is that where it stops? That's where it's, yes, that could, the, the taxable wage base is a formula for that uh, and how we get to that, but basically the way it is is that would be $71,000. That's the uh, minimum amount somebody would have to earn to earn the maximum weekly rate that we have for the maximum duration of 30 weeks. If anyone earns more than $71,000, they still all, that, that's all they'd be able to get. Uh, so that's where it, it ends. That's the, the, the minimum amount that you would need to qualify for the maximum rate for the maximum duration. And that's, so that's recalculated every year. And what is the max weekly rate? Uh, currently, the max week weekly rate is eight hundred fifty-two dollars, and that's re that, that's uh, recalculated every year as well. Uh, they, there's always a, it's all obviously in the uh, in the law, and I, again, I don't want to get you bogged down on that, but it is all by statute, so it's self-regulating. Uh, every um, spring, our labor market information unit has to do the calculations. Uh, and our benefit rate, a maximum benefit rate is adjusted every uh, July. Uh, it could go, uh, I've been here 29 years, and it's never going down. It's always remained the same or increased, but theoretically, uh, it could go down. Uh, it's based on the average weekly wage in Rhode Island for uh, the prior calendar year. So theoretically, I guess if you had a stagflation you know, situation or something and, and wages really went down, then the benefit rate uh, calculation maximum rate the next year could go down. I, like I said, that has not happened in my career, but it's not that it's always the same or going up. It's just recalculated every July. And so, this, so the, um, the fund that it's put into, 
Mm -hmm. um, has that ever come close to uh, being insolvent, like during any? No, no. Okay, because that's another thing that's also in there. So that's not dependent on any any uh, legislative action. It's already in the TDI Act as to how it, uh, it it's calculated the rates, and uh, so it's uh, nobody has to touch it. If that's looked at every fall. And I don't want to get too, too complicated, like I said, but basically there's a formula where we're looking at the, the, the six, last six months expenditures in the TDI fund versus the balance in the fund. And if our expenditures are more than, than what the fund balance has on hand, then the tax rate for the next calendar year is adjusted upwards. Uh, if it's, you know, we're around the same, then the tax rate stays the same. And if the, uh, if the balance of the trust fund is healthy, and uh, then the tax rate can go down. And that's what's happened in Rhode Island uh, in, in recent years. Uh, we were at 1.2% for about six years. And then it went down to the 1.1% that I just quoted you uh, a year ago, and it remained 1.1% for this year as well. And how many months do you how many months do you have in your in the fund? How many months? Um... The cushion. Yes. Yeah. They, the calculation is like I said is it's, it's looking it's looking at a six month balance. So basically, if uh, it's it's looking to make sure that there's enough money in the fund to pay six months worth of benefits, even if no more tax dollars came in. And and if I receive, so if I receive, um, well, if, if I uh, need to apply for this insurance, who yep. do I who do I apply to, and how is the decision made? Okay, so you're applying. It's, it's temporary disability insurance is part of the Rhode Island Department of Labor and Training. Uh, that's another. That's another thing I didn't mention. I guess before when I was saying I was 100 percent employee side, but also 100 percent government run. Uh, some of the other states that you may read about or, or, or investigate, they have where uh, employers can maybe self-insure or third-party insurers can provide um, policies uh, to satisfy that. We don't do that here. Uh, we're 100 percent government run, so it's, it's run by the taxes that are withheld from the employee's pay, uh, remitted to the Department of the Division of Taxation, Employer Tax Unit. And then uh, the benefits are administered by temporary disability insurance here at the Department of Labor and Training. So you would file a claim, uh, right? You know, at Department of Labor and Training, we have, we're the ones who administrate, and all the ways to apply are on our website. And we allow you to either apply by paper or online. So if I make forty thousand dollars a year, I mean, given your eight hundred and fifty-two dollar cap, roughly. If I make roughly forty thousand dollars a year, I can expect a um, hundred percent wage replacement. But if I make eighty thousand dollars a year, I'm going to get roughly fifty percent. No, wage. no, because I, I, that all we were talking about there was the maximum entitlement. We weren't talking about the calculation. So how is that calculated? Then? Okay, so that's a percentage of the highest quarter of earnings in the in the base period for the claim. So we we are. Um, a, very, our, uh, the laws in Rhode Island temporary disability insurance program is very much mirrored and piggybacked or on the un on the employment security program in Rhode Island. So we use the same base periods as they do in unemployment, and then we calculate benefits in a very similar way. Um, like, like it's a it's a funny calculation, but uh, it, it ends up uh, somebody is going to get roughly about eighty percent of their take home. Uh, Typical take home is what they're going to end up with in their, in their TDI benefit. And is that then taxed, or is it the way that it's set up? Is it is it is it considered? Uh, no, the TDI program is not taxed. Uh, it's not considered taxable income. What about the TCI? The TCI component, the IRS has determined that it is taxable income. Um, so that we do send 1099s. So the as a matter of fact, we're getting a lot of people contacting us now asking where the 1099s are, and they've already gone out, so obviously <laughs> some people haven't gotten them yet, but uh, that, that's something we have to do on the TCI end of it. So I'm going to step back a little bit. So 13, 13 weeks is the average usage of something that someone has access to for up to 30 weeks. Is that right? Right, right, right. The, 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 the average claim last year was about 13 weeks. 
um, of it, but the maximum anybody could collect in a clean year would be 30 weeks. And that can be 13 weeks of, I need uh, two weeks to take care of, well, it's all personal stuff except for the TCI. So it's uh, if I sprain my ankle and I need two weeks off, I can apply. Right, and then a month later or something else happens and you get off for another four weeks or you had a serious illness and you're off for another, it's it, it, up to whatever, whatever the, the maximum we, we determine you're entitled to in a heat claim year. By law, that, that number cannot exceed 30, but it's a calculation and most claims don't qualify for 34 weeks. And what about enforcement, uh, abuse enforcement? Uh, what kind of enforcement? Yeah, abuse. Oh, abuse, okay. Well. The, the good part about that is the last time we had uh, an audit, I think they looked at over 40,000 claims and they came up with only 42 that they thought were possibly um, had an issue. And again, that's not, they say those 42 didn't actually have an issue. They were saying that there was 42 that possibly might. So that's a really minuscule number. The, the good portion about it is because you have to get your doctor to sign the forms and we're verifying the last day of work with the employer, in order to have some sort of fraud or anything, you're going to have to get a whole lot of other people involved who have no uh, reason to be involved. Um, but we do it. But we do have a fraud unit, and they do investigate claims, and it does happen. Um, so there's the Department of Labor Training has an unemployment insurance, temporary disability insurance fraud unit, and uh, they're our investigative arm, um, and they want to go out and do things. And then based on what they come up with, they'll either work with the attorney general, or uh, if it's something involving doctors, they'll they'll get the Department of Health involved because the Department of Health is the one who licenses the uh, the doctors. So Rhode Islanders have other sources that they use that's not TCI in case they need to take care of children or their or their parents. No, no, okay. no. There is no other program. Um, there is a paid, they, they, the legislature did pass a year ago uh, paid sick leave. Um, so somebody could do that if they had to take a day here, a day there, but uh, in terms of anything, um, a week or more, they would be having to file for TCI. And can you speak to why only four weeks of, pers of, of family care? Like, politi uh, like politically, how did, that, how did that number come up? As I mean, that 30 weeks is very generous and four weeks right. is, is, is Kind of not, and in, in, in right, right. Well, I don't, I can't speak honestly. I'm not the legislator. I don't know what their intent was. Um, I, I can only guess is the, the reason is it's not necessarily, you know, if uh, somebody's having a long term family situation, the month off work with pay gives you time to come up with the plan, so to speak, to take care of that situation. It isn't necessarily the plan, but that's just me conjecture. I really don't know. I don't, I, I not the legislature. I don't write the laws. I, I just administer the ones that they write us. No, I appreciate that, and and I, and it's always it's always hard not to ask uh, the administrators those questions. But I appreciate. Sure, it. No, I, sure, but I, but again, that's not you know that's not my role. Um, you know, they 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 tell us that they write the laws, and then we do our best to make it happen. <laughs> and and we can look this up certainly. But what what do you consider for the TCI? What do you consider family? Oh, okay. Yeah, um, don't want to forget anybody, but it's uh, it, it it would it, I'm trying to think what they put in the bill uh, off the top of my head without going to look it up for you. But it's parent, spouse, child, um, in law, um, it's. It, we can we can find it. That's that's. Yeah, it's it's, it's right on our website. I just I always I don't want to forget anybody. Um, but it's 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 basics. It's who you would consider to be a family member. Um, let's see. So it's uh, it's child, parent, spouse, domestic partner, parent-in-law, or grandparent. Now the important thing on that domestic partner that. That does not mean uh, girlfriend or boyfriend. That means specifically a domestic partner under Rhode Island law, um, which is two people of the same sex who have entered a civil union. So we sometimes get people file, trying to file and uh, don't understand the legal meaning in Rhode Island for domestic partner as opposed to um, what they consider, you know, what they think the, the interpretation of that is. 
And, and committee, anytime you have a question, please um, pipe up. Um, so I, I, just to circle back on one of the things that you had brought up, say something. I'm, I'm your theoretical person, of somebody who makes around $40,000 a year, that person's going to qualify in Rhode Island law for around $460 a, a week. Okay. But those are, and, 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 and again, if I, if I apply, if, oh, oh, Ray, I broke my ankle, um, right. you're, you're going to make a determination based on whatever the, whatever. Right, um, right, right. And again, because we're uh, part of, you know, the Department of Labor and Training and we're kind of, uh, we're in the same division with unemployment insurance and our laws mirror each other, we, we piggyback on a lot of the same data that they do. Uh, makes, which is a, also something that makes it easier for the employers. They would hold the uh, employees' contributions of TDI from the pay, and they remit it quarterly. They remit the TDI taxes with their employment security taxes and the wages that they need to report to the wage record uh, division of our division of taxation. So um, they're dealing with the division of taxation on that, you know, quarterly, all the same. So it's not like a separate uh, mechanism or separate bureaucracy that they have to deal with. And so we're going to make our calculations based on the wages in the wage record system of the division of taxation as reported by the employers. And, and again, that for that $40,000 a year person, the four six. Your theoretical one would end up just based on our calculation. It's actually, you gave me a nice easy number to deal with because I could take $40,000 and divide it by four and come up with a quarterly uh, number of $10,000 times the, the, the calculation we do. And so it's very easy for me to tell you around $460 on that theoretical person. Okay, okay and that, and that, um, that's equivalent, is that the same calculation that you'd make for unemployment insurance? Uh, no, they actually use a, a, a less generous calculation. Okay, and uh, same for workers' uh, comp? It, yeah, and, I, and obviously I, there's reasons for that. Uh, I, I don't know what happened in Vermont a few years ago when the, <coughs> with, with the recession, but a year the employment security trust fund uh, had, had a problem, and so they had to adjust a lot of the laws and make things a little less generous to try to uh, re replenish the fund and repay the money that they had borrowed from the US DOL. Uh, I don't know if that happened in, in Vermont or not. Uh, it happened in a number of states, though. Yeah, it did happen here. Where <coughs> yeah. I think we just heard from our Department of Labor that they're that they've just finally put the unemployment payments back on CPI anyway. So, right, um, right. but it took a while. Yeah, so uh, as a result of that, there was a big, uh, there was a lot of changes in employment security law in Rhode Island. And uh, so taxes on the employers went up, but also benefits to the claimants went down as a way to try to, you know, re you know replenish the funds, so to speak, and make it more sustainable. Um, so their calculation is not as generous as ours, but it's similar. What is your administrative um, percentage, do you think, of the money that you take in as a government okay, running? Yes, yes. I always like talking about this because um, I, I know that people always try to consider the private options and things like that. But over the last 20 to 25 years, we've averaged 5% or less in, in uh, administrative costs for the program. And is that a result of, of just having a really mature program? Uh, well, I... I, I I think that's probably part of it. Um, we, we, uh, I, I just think that you take the, the private component out of it. Obviously, they're going to have to make a profit, so there's going to be other other pressures there. Whereas we don't have any of that. Uh, we're just running the program as best we can. Uh, with, you know, trying to make sure that the tax rate doesn't go up, but the benefits go out. And how how many people um, pay into this program, or how many people? What's or what's the What's your uptake? I guess both. What's your what's your percentage uptake on this? Um, it, oh, I have to see if I can find that for you very uh, quickly. I don't have that right available. I think I, I want to say a year ago, it might, I, I want to say that the percentage was like around an eight percent uptake off the top of my head. How many folks? How many um, working Rhode Islanders are there? Do you know? Uh, covered by the program is a, a little over 450,000. Yeah, we have substantially less. Um, surprise, surprise. But, um, 
as we're, we're less than George or more? You're less. I mean, I'm we're sorry, less. We're, we're less. Vermont's less. Vermont's less. So that's what I thought. Um, and that, that so participate, and that's number of participating you know, who are subject to TDI law. There are more than that working in Rhode Island, but that's the number of people who are subject to TDI law and paying and having taxes with health from the K. Uh, uh, Representative Zott has a question. Uh, I was just curious if you had the average turnaround time between when a claim is initiated and that person receives the check. Yep, I can tell you that 100% of the claimants get a payment or a decision telling them why they're not getting paid in three weeks or less. Do you include... Uh, Independent contractors or LLC, you know, just uh, sole proprietors? No, they do not participate in the program. It's a, it's a W-2 payroll employment for subject employers. Representative by and that's, And subject employers, that's all private employment. And then uh, governmental entities who have elected to participate for different classes of, of, uh, of, of employee. Who is that? Well, any a governmental entity is uh, they're automatically exempt from participating unless they opt in, and so a lot of them end up opting in to cover classes of of, uh, of worker based on bargaining unit agreements, where the uh, the uh, union workers want to participate and they kind of bargain in that they want to participate, and so they cover that class that whatever's in that. I'll give you a, a typical example would be school. Uh, uh, you know, a, a school department, but and it, it would be—it's not uncommon in Rhode Island for a school department that for their 12-month employees to participate in GDI and their teachers not to. Okay, uh, Representative Byron. Uh, yeah, if there's a, a denial to a claim, is there an appeal process, or is the denial yeah. final? Yes, yes. A a any decision is appealable. Uh, again, as I've mentioned many times, we, we're uh, kind of a uh, partner or sister to our unemployment insurance program. So they would uh, appeal. Uh, it, we would obviously investigate to see if it's something that's on our end that we can, that's, uh, you know, fixable. If we are convinced that the claim should be denied, then we will forward it to uh, the Board of Review for Rhode Island that handles uh, employment security and temporary disability insurance claims. And uh, they'll have a hearing before a referee at the Board of Review. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So what haven't we asked yet? I'm sorry. I mean, without getting all, I mean, I know that you, you've been very good about, about not um, <clears throat> geeking out too deeply into it. We are legislators after all, but um, what, what, what am I missing or what are we missing in our questions so far? Is there anything glaring in, in any of the questions that we've asked? Oh, okay. So yeah, yeah like I said, I'm sorry. Sometimes when I'm trying to listen because I know you're on speaker, it's hard. So you're basically saying, is there anything that I should tell you, that you want to know that you should know that you haven't asked me? Yes. <laughs> okay. I'm trying to think. Um, no, I mean the, the highlights in Rhode Island. I, I, again, is you have to figure out obviously what works for Vermont, which is not necessarily what works for Rhode Island. But I can tell you that we've been doing this since 1942. The trust fund has never gone bankrupt, um, we're paying people in three weeks or less, we're doing it for less than 5% overhead, but we are the only game that's 100% um, government run, so I would think that you need, really do need to consider that strongly when you're looking at a program, because it does take that whole profit margin thing out of, uh, out of the equation, so hopefully you're getting more for your, your tax dollars. Um, again, obviously, I am a uh, a, a government employee, so uh, you know I'm proud of the program. But that it, I can tell you that it does work and it has worked uh, before I was the administrator, and it will work after I uh, long after I'm gone, I'm sure. Right, committee, any further questions for Ray? Ray, this has been very helpful. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Um, if we have any follow-up questions, we'll be sure to do that. But this was this was. Uh, really uh, a, a, a nice session with you. So thank you very okay. much. Very good. Uh, yeah, the, I guess the, the, his name was Ron Wild. He has all my contact information if somebody had a follow-up that, that we didn't touch on. 
I would advise you to go to our website. There is a lot of information there. Um, and, and of course, there's a link to all our, our laws. And so uh, that can give you a good head start to, to things to think about. Our legislative council is sitting in the room, and I'm sure he just bookmarked it. So um, thank you very much. OK. All right, have a good afternoon. Yes, good afternoon. Okay. Every state does it differently. Oh boy, yeah, that was interesting. Um, so, Damien, here you are. Good afternoon. For the record, Damien Leonard, Legislative Council. Hello. Red button. Uh, so, where would you like me to begin? Um, do you want to ask questions? Do you want me to go through the administration uh, in the bill? Uh, well, um, what's our pleasure? I mean, it, we heard their numbers. I mean, our numbers, again, are, are different because we have less employees. We have a different number, taxation number that's lower than this. We, we have our guesstimates of usage are higher than this. I believe we're at, is it 13 percent that, that, what was the number that Joyce came up with? Do we remember? Um, Don't remember. I'll okay. Tell it's, a, it's in our documents, but, um, but this bill, I mean, we heard, we heard this, our H107 proposes essentially what Rhode Island has put into place with some pretty key exceptions, but the idea that it's a government run insurance product mm -hmm. and that their administration is at five percent which is maybe a little bit lower than we put in but we have to start up right so we've uh, our modeling was done on an estimate of seven and a half percent and uh, the startup costs uh, that were quoted last year uh, for a similar bill were above that for the initial years so we're looking at, and Joyce did some projection um, of kind of the uh, sort of bump in expenses in the early years of setting up IT and, and uh, adopting rules and so forth, and then the expenses leveling out as time goes on. Uh, and so that, that was available last year. Um, and that's something I can uh, forward to Ron for him to post for the committee. Um, but that, that's something, that's a difference between us and a more mature program is that our initial years will have some expenses. Um, it would potentially be, if the data was available, uh, it would be interesting to look at Washington uh, State, Massachusetts, and Washington, D.C., none of which have a mature program, and all of whom are also starting from scratch. Uh, but they they would have some information too at this point on what their startup costs are, um, and it's with those three states. Just for comparison's sake, we're seeing contribution rates in Washington State uh, of 0.4 percent split between uh, the employer and the employee, 0.62 in Washington D.C and 0.63 split between employer and employee in, in Massachusetts for their initial rates. Uh, their benefits are a little bit different. Um, their max benefits are a little bit different. Um, and their coverage is a little bit different. But those are sort of the rates that we're seeing in those states. Um, in the, the more established states, you're seeing rates of 0.9%, or I'm sorry, 1% in California. And I'm looking at the old one here. I sent Ron an updated chart. Uh, I believe 1.1 is Rhode Island right now. Yeah. Um, and New York State is uh, a little bit funky because there's the old TDI program in New York State where employees pay 0.5% up to a max of 60 cents per week. And the employer covers the balance of the cost. Uh, so this was, uh, but it's all part of the employer's workers comp policy. Um, so the, the pooling of those costs, uh, it's, you know, you're not on just an outside of work. And then the benefit under that program was extremely small. 
Um, so you're, again, it's not an apples to apples comparison. Do we have any idea of how long startup costs might run out in years? Uh, you're looking at probably, if I remember last year's uh, testimony on that issue, we're looking at probably two to three years. Okay. Um, so most of the modeling projects two years to build up IT and get the uh, human infrastructure in place and adopt rules. Uh, this bill and last year's bill are essentially looking at 12 months to get things in place to start collecting contributions and another 15 months uh, after that to uh, build up the fund going forward. Is that right? Two you know, years? It's a little bit. It's two, full, it's two years that. complete, is it? So it's, it's one year to, to get things in place, and then it's July 1 of 2020 through October 1 of 2021 to get to the point of 75%. Uh, of 75%. So, yeah, so that, that is 15 months to get to that sort of funding the reserve and having enough money in there so that if there's a rush on day one, you're not going to be out of money. Representative Mosh. So looking at the figures that you have regarding the states, do you have population, working population figures? I'm wondering, since the states are different, mm -hmm. percentages are different, has the workforce, the numbers of people in the workforce, has that had a bearing, perhaps, on the how they have formulated? Yeah, is there? You can't make a comparison, I understand that. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering if there is some way of making a determination um, how they arrived at the model that they were using. Was it likely on numbers of people working? And, and also, this is a combination of employer and employee. If I, I'm understanding this right, whereas Rhode Island is only employee. Right, and it varies so, from state to state. So uh, the funding mechanism, um, let me just pull up the updated family leave. So the funding mechanism in the states um, varies somewhat dramatically. Uh, New Jersey splits between employer and employee. Uh, New York splits between employer and employee for the disability insurance, but then family care is entirely covered by employees. Uh, and Washington State splits between employer and employee, as does Massachusetts. Washington, D.C. puts the entire cost on the employer. Uh, and then Rhode Island uh, puts, and California both put the entire cost on the employee. Uh, so there is there is that. There is obviously, with each of these statements, there's differences in the population. But the model um, that's used to develop this is based on demographic information from the state uh, that it's modeling it for, and then plugging in the parameters of the program. So they look at American Community Surveys data that's prepared by the US Census over a period of a couple of years. Uh, I think it's a four-year period. And then they take that data and plug it into their model uh, with certain parameters, like their 7.5% assumed administrative cost, and then the other requirements that might be in the program to get to their estimates for what you need as a contribution to actually support this. And part of that is based on historical data over uptake in other states, and then trying to extrapolate that onto the demographics of the state. So it's an estimate. Um, there's no guarantee that it's perfectly accurate, um, but they're basing it on some more established programs to try to, to get there. And the splits are different percentage-wise between employer and employee, depending upon the state? Yes. So uh, Massachusetts is creatively worded to get to what is essentially a 50-50 split. So what they looked at uh, when they were doing it is um, what is the sort of usage and cost associated with each thing 
Um, and then they set the percentages, even though the percentages don't read as 50-50, in the end they work out to 50-50 roughly, although there will be a little fluctuation. Uh, uh, Washington State is, I'm just going to ballpark off the top of my head and say that looks closer to 60-40, um, but it's a 0.145 for the employer, so 0.145% for the employer and 0.255% for the employee. Washington State is still in that uh, pre-usage period where they're building up their fund. So they're at their initial um, funding period and they're, they're going to be effective on January 2020. So one year from now, people will just begin, be beginning to use the benefits there. Um, Washington, D.C., it's 0.62% for employers. Uh, and then in New Jersey, it's 0.25% on the first 34,000 for employees, uh, but then it's based on experience for employers, and employers in New Jersey have the option of purchasing a private uh, um, leave insurance policy that at least meets the requirements of the state policy, uh, if they find that to be more cost effective or otherwise more desirable. Same in California. If they can find a policy that meets the minimum terms of the state uh, and it works better for them, they can do that. But in that case, so in that case, the employee still is paying the 0.25% regardless of whether their employer is using the state run or the private run? Is that? I think that they have, they can't charge the employees anymore, but they could charge them less. Uh, and New Jersey's got some other sort of, um, and it's been a while since I looked at their law, but if I remember rightly, there are um, there are employee consent provisions in there too. So if the employer wants to switch over, either one way or the other, the employees have a, a chance to say no. Um, and I cannot remember exactly how that works, but that's something I could report back to the committee on if, if you wanted more information on that. Uh, Representative Palacki in the department. Um, can you help me understand um, places like the ski industry or Shelburne Farms that have seasonal, they have more than 10 employees, but then seasonally they build out. Would those build out employees, would they be eligible for this? And in the summertime, if they're like at the Shelburne Farms, or in the wintertime, if they're one of the ski resorts? Potentially. So under the H-107, you're actually not required to be attached to an employer when you take the leave. Uh, so there is the potential that I could be a seasonal employee, and if I earn the minimum amount of earnings, so I've paid contributions on the roughly $11,200 of wages, taxable wages that I have to pay contributions on, and then I work for, let's say, Smuggler's Notch, and they cut me loose at the end of the ski season, and I'm looking for a job when um, a family member is diagnosed with something and I have to stay home and care for them, and I can no longer look for a job, I could then take this benefit, uh, and then they would look back at my average weekly wage uh, during the past year, and uh, calculate what my benefit would be and I could take the benefit there as long as I'd earned that amount and paid the amount into the program. If on the other hand I was brought on by say a retailer for a month before Christmas and I earned, you know, let's say I was working an extra 15 hours a week um, and so I've, you know, maybe I had $2,000 in earnings or something like that um, over the whole holiday season. Um, but I hadn't gotten up to that $11,200 cutoff, and I had no other earnings in the last 12 months in the state, then I wouldn't be eligible for the program because I hadn't made enough contributions, uh, regardless of whether I was attached to an employer or not. So that's, that's kind of where our program is similar to some programs and different from others. So we don't require attachment to the employer, you just have to have worked enough in the state uh, to get to the sort of the point where we've said that seems reasonable, where you've made enough contributions to the fund that you can now withdraw 
benefits from the fund. Uh, and it prevents people from you know, doing something like working in Vermont for two weeks and then taking family leave right away uh, you know, on, on the, the short-term earnings. But if you have people who, uh, we do have a lot of seasonal employees in the state and provided they're earning that minimum amount, or people who work two or three jobs over the course of the year, again, provided they earn that minimum amount, they're eligible for benefits, whether they're between jobs or with an employer. Uh, the, the big question if they are with an employer is whether they would qualify for job protection or not. Uh, and that's something where your employer has to be large enough to be covered by our job protected unpaid leave law in order for you to get the job protection under H-107 as it's currently written. Um, a minute ago you talked about in some of the other states if you wanted to shift uh, mechanisms from private public <coughs> and it was an employee vote, what percentage of that of the employees would have to vote to change over? Is it a clean like 51 49, two thirds? I can't remember the specifics. Okay. I think probably the best thing for me to do would be to um, pull up that language and just send a summary to the committee. Great. Thank you. Damien, does any of this leave qualify? Um, I was asked earlier today, does any of this leave um, qualify as bereavement leave? Uh, no. So we need to ask Joyce, what is what represents 75%? What represents the money to start the program? I mean, we're talking about taking 25 months or 20, 28 months almost to, to start a program from scratch. Um, what represents the 75? And I'm not counting the start. The startup costs are a different number. But, but what is it? Is that still a Joyce number for us to ask? If you give me a second, I'll pull up last year's um, bill. Uh, and uh, Joyce prepared a summary for last year. Um, my iPad is frozen for a moment. But um, I'll pull that up and give you just kind of a summary from last year. Um, these numbers might change this year, uh, depending on testimony from the uh, executive branch and uh, how the bill ends up. But. Do you want another question while you're waiting? Or? Sure. You can give me another <laughs> question and I'll, I'll answer while I, while you're while I work on this. <laughs> um, we talked last, last year, we talked this year a little bit about the notion of startup costs and that uh, starting with, if this bill were to become law July 1st, the, the account is zero. Uh, we're starting from scratch. And that there's an element of, and I know it's DFRs in the room, but there's an element where um, the program can bar, essentially have a credit card. Like they can borrow against anticipated revenues. Can you explain that? And like the, the, this ostensibly would be the way that we would say, well, we need X amount of dollars to buy the computer system to, to uh, monitor this program, to, to administer this program, uh, where does it come from? Right, so under existing law related to special funds, there is authorization for uh, the Commissioner of Finance and Management to uh, issue warrants against anticipated revenues. Um, typically that's done on a very short term basis. Uh, in this instance, because it was set at a year out, the Appropriations Committee had us explicitly put in that language uh, to make it clear that uh, they could issue warrants basically against anticipated revenues from year two. Um, the alternative approach uh, would be to just appropriate the funds outright for the first year. Uh, the 
And the reason you may want to consider that alternative is because when you're borrowing funds against anticipated revenues, they need to be paid back with interest. So it actually ends up being more expensive for the program in the long run to do it that way. Uh, you're also, um, in some ways, setting the precedent of large-scale borrowing against the, the overall special funds balance. Um, and I'm not a finance person, so I can't tell you on a given year how much certain special funds borrow against the overall balance of the accounts. Um, but uh, it does happen, I just don't know how much. Um, but the, that language was included last year just because the scale we were talking was millions of dollars with revenues not anticipated for 12 months at least. So uh, that you know, is a significant upfront cost without an appropriation going with it. So when you say it would set a precedent, is that implying any, is that implying that this is not a normal practice? Uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer that. Uh, it's probably a Steve Klein question, but uh, it's not something that I've, I've come across in my four and a half years here, um, but that may have been done for other programs in the past. That, that's what made it into the bills last year. Uh, this year, new legislature, you may want to try a different language, uh, more specifically appropriate money. Um, so it's a different different budgetary year and so forth, but that's really a, a <laughs> policy decision for the legislature as to how they want to approach this uh, going forward. Yes? Uh, I know you, you have lots of things going on, but any clarity around the foster care age and aging out of foster care? So uh, I have not had a chance to reach out to the contact at DCF. Uh, my colleague Katie McClinn couldn't think of a reason why 16 would be the cutoff. Uh, so that may be something that it's worth getting DCF in to testify on um, about whether that number should stay at 16 years of age. And I am not aware of any particular historical reason, but like I mentioned last week, uh, we're back almost 28 years ago now that that language was put into statute. Uh, and so the, the circumstances may have been very different then uh, in terms of what, what they were looking to protect. Thank you. There we go. Okay, I've got the cash flow numbers from last year. <laughs> so I apologize. I took a little looking too while I was answering questions. Um, yeah, I can do that. Um, do we have a hook up here? Is it down here? There we go. Great. Yeah, let me put this up on the screen. It will just take a second. That'll be easier for everyone to look at. And committee, just as if you notice, Robertson Howard is not here, so we might have to be recruiting another. Um, iPad Meister um, to help the witnesses. Yeah, so the this I should again note is these were preliminary uh, rough numbers for last year's bill. Um, so we we're talking about uh, different benefits, very different contribution rate. Um, but this will give you a little bit of a sense of what we're looking at. So just stand up here. Um, so these are your revenues from contributions up here. Uh, so we're back a year in the fiscal year, but in the first year, no revenues would come in because your, your IT system just wouldn't be set up to accept them. Then going out after that, you're looking at about $18 million a year. And this was on last year's can't remember if this was the final version of the bill or not, but it was 0.136 or 0.18 was the contribution rate that we were looking at then. The revenues would be significantly higher under H107 because you're looking at a 0.93% contribution rate, roughly. Uh, and that number may, as Joyce mentioned last week, will probably change after the new modeling is done. So you could be looking at something closer to uh, 80 or 100 million dollars a year 
if the contribution rate stays up at this level. Um, so there are a lot of moving parts. The total cost, though, uh, so this is the total number for benefits, IT, administration, and reserves. Uh, you'll notice in the first year, we're looking at about $300,000 in change for IT development. Uh, and then the admin number was bumped up to 8%. Um, and so we're looking at uh, $518,000 for, uh, for the personnel costs in the administration, um, and then $333,000 for IT. The second year, again, about $550 for personnel, and then another $160 for IT. And then going out into fiscal year 2021, you start to see benefits paid out and the IT costs drop to zero. Uh, and then you'll notice the personnel costs go up significantly to 1.3 million and then 1.7, 1.8 million in out years. Part of the reason for this is the reason the first year is a lower cost is because you start uh, with one quarter of the year already gone. So it's only three quarters of a year. And then the first full year would have been fiscal year 2022 with last year's bill, all of these years would advance one year with H107. Uh, so what you're basically looking at, you'll notice here, is that when you're in the fully operating years there, uh, at the projections here in Joyce's model, uh, you're looking at actually the funds being slightly less than the output. That could be adjusted for by the legislature by tweaking with the contribution rate. Um, so, uh, with the reserves here, uh, the reserve is building up, uh, and then it shows what the needed additions are to the reserves each year as we go forward. So, we're looking at an additional $13 million. Here's that negative interest I talked about, so $17,000 of extra cost from borrowing that need to be paid back. And then each year here, the additions to the reserves go way down going into year two and then the, these other years. And the additions to the reserves in those years are because we expect the benefits payments to be going up. So the nine month reserve has to go up along with benefits payments as they go up for uh, both increased uptake and uh, inflation. And then the. So this looks like um, an allocation, to a startup allocation of 518,000 would offset $17,000 in interest. Is that safe to say? Yes, it's actually 851. Oh, 851, yeah, okay. Yeah, so that, that was the startup estimation again for last year's bill. Right. Now, the big caveat <coughs> with this was that the IT development costs um, the estimates were all over the place, and that could be the major cost driver uh, for this. So with the Department of Labor last year, uh, their IT development costs were over $10 million, rather than the half a million projected here. I believe tax had a much lower cost, but I think it was still in the millions of dollars. Uh, and part of the reason for this is because the I believe the original modeling was based on the idea that we could do like Rhode Island did and piggyback very tightly on our existing UI system for a variety of reasons, uh, the main one being that we're part of a consortium of, with two other states that's overhauling our, our UI IT system and neither of them have this program, we're unable to piggyback on our UI IT system. Uh, which leaves us either creating the system over a tax and then also creating a way for tax to talk to labor uh, or um, creating a new system out of whole cloth, uh, which would be more expensive. So that's why this bill has the dual administration. Um, but this was, these were some of the numbers towards the end that were developed. Just to give you an idea of the cash flow, I think with this bill we're talking about like I said, larger income and probably higher IT costs, uh, ultimately. But you're going to want to hear from the administration and Joyce uh, and the modeler a bit more on that. 
Right, and those are the numbers that won't be available for a little while. A couple of weeks, yeah. yeah. Representative Byron. Uh, my question is actually kind of in that thread. So the first two years, 1920, you have the IT product development, but then I don't see anything allocated for upkeep, maintenance, right. integration, stuff like that. There's There doesn't seem to be any kind of estimated allocation. So that is that rolled into the admin costs. Okay, so it fall under. That's my understanding okay. and memory of this. So, so oh, it falls under that same admin IT benefits yeah. reserves. Yeah, and actually, cetera. you can see I mentioned that I wasn't sure what the payroll tax was. It's at 0.15 percent. It's listed on the uh, mm -hmm. the top line. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, again, the ultimate payroll tax last year was lower, um, and in this this bill, it's much higher. Okay. I was just kind of more curious about like if there was any like long range projection as to what the back end maintenance for the IT systems, you know, how do you have to just constantly keep up updates, software development, fixing bugs, tweaks. Yeah, like I think most of that's rolled into admin. I okay. think um, one of the realities is that periodically you need a full overhaul, mm -hmm. uh, which is what our UI system is going through right now. Um, and in our UI systems case, it's particularly expensive because they, their IT system dates back to the early 1990s. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a little bit outdated at this point. <laughs> um, Same numbers. <laughs> Representative Zott and then Kalecki. So you mentioned, I think when you were pointing to 20, yeah, 2022, the discrepancy between the total costs and the revenue, right? And then right. you mentioned, that uh, that the legislature would then have to revisit and set, reset the rate. But if I understood when Rhode Island was talking, they don't have to revisit the issue. It sounded like there was no active uh, maintenance required. If there's something in statute that allows it, to, they just set a number and it goes. Is that? So that is one option, actually, for this bill. Uh, it's something that last biennium's Ways and Means Committee did not like. Um, they didn't like which, they didn't like uh, doing a set it and forget it model. They wanted more legislative oversight on the rate, uh, which is something we do for some other rates that are variable. Um, so, and I think part of that was uh, concerns about are we setting the, the reserve correctly? Um, and are the projected rates reasonable and, and folks wanted to be able to revisit it uh, and possibly make larger tweaks if necessary to keep the rates at what they thought were reasonable now going forward. Um, there are There is precedent for this model, like I mentioned, in the workers' comp system for the administration fund. Um, our UI system is more of a set it and forget it model. Um, Although that's that's based on a much, you know, bigger sort of model that's designed to kind of go up and down over time. Uh, so you're you fluctuate between rate schedules, uh, depending on the ratio of benefits paid to the balance in the fund for the state. Um, and so when the, the balance of the fund dips, you go up to a higher tax schedule. And then when the balance of the fund grows, you drop down. We're currently on a dropping down phase. Uh, presumably when the next recession hits, we'll go back to a climbing up phase and then go back down later once the, the fund stabilizes. Could, could you put in the bill a hybrid that says, you know, could you put it in statute that for the first five, first ten years we'll revisit it each year and then at a certain point we'll, we'll have enough data to determine that we can set it and forget it? Um, Instead of relying on that decision being made down the down the road, having it built in that the decision will be made down the road, you could. Um, the one thing is that you can never bind a future legislature, so they can always notwithstand that and tweak the rates. Um, the we could go with a, a slightly different rate setting model, though, uh, going forward, and I could could model it on some of the other states that have followed more of their UI model, which is more of a passive, it, it sets the rate on a predetermined formula, 
rather than uh, requiring human input with approval by the, the tax setting committees um, every year. I'm a little, um, Joyce is going to redo this, is that? Yes, yeah, so this was a yeah. preliminary projection for last biennium's bill before we had final numbers. So the IT development cost was an estimate, um, and future estimates came in higher, and the payroll tax rate, because of the the benefits were still in flux at that point, actually ended up being higher than the tax rate that was ultimately set uh, in that bill. The What happened with that bill was uh, it left this committee with one set of benefits. Those benefits were reduced in ways and means to make it less expensive. And then they were reduced again in the Senate to make it less expensive again. Um, so that's why we ended up with uh, a significantly lower tax rate uh, than other states that have this program um, have because we got rid of own care and then we limited uh, family care outside of bonding leave. Because the, the, in year four and five, those are significant deficits. Those are, and that was another thing that this assumed was a flat <laughs> contribution rate. It assumed no adjustments. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so this was just kind of showing what would happen if we set it and forget it for the initial years. Uh, and one of the things, one of the other pieces that was going on, if I remember right, uh, and I could be, if I remember right, was that uh, the wage base was not growing as quickly as the, um, up the usage during those first few years as people became more familiar with the program uh, and started to use it more and wage growth was continuing. So. And in, the, in our new model now, we've limited the cap, so there'll actually be less taxable salaries in this. So, the, so the, the that, this past bill also had that, oh, it did. Okay. that cap on the wage base. Um, and I can't remember if the inflation adjustment had been added to the wage base when this was drafted or not, but I think it had. Thank you. Um, but yeah, that was one of the issues, is there's a discrepancy in the wage base versus the growth and use of benefits in early years, at least. Again, Joyce can provide more color um, to these, this sort of picture. Does the modeling just go out five years in this kind of thing? Or could we see a different picture if it went out 10 years with the sustainability of this reserve fund? Uh, I'm, I'm sure we could see a somewhat, um, I mean, I'm sure we could model it out that far. I don't know how accurate it would okay. be. One of the problems when you start modeling it out way down the road is now you're getting into a situation where you're almost certain to have a recession somewhere in there which will throw things for a loop. And modeling demographics out 10 years, that's a lot of projecting. So I'm, I'm sure Joyce could put the numbers in there, but I think the further out you get, the shakier the numbers get. Um, but yeah, I mean, this, this is all stuff that is probably a good discussion with Joyce and maybe a good thing to kind of let her know what the committee wants to see in terms of modeling before this bill moves. Um, and then there will be some, some info from the modeling done by uh, the Institute for Women's Policy Research when they come back with the new contribution rate. Uh, and we can use some of that info going forward. Other questions? Does anybody have questions about the administration? No, I just using. It's hard to comment more on the chart because it's it's a. I mean, the eight percent, for instance, it's like well, there's a lot of different numbers popping along there. It just now, let's just leave it at, at that for now. And okay. then, um, I, I mean, I think that if we were to use the point, if we were to use, if I were to use this number at all, I would say, oh, okay, so 0.15, we went up to 0.93. 
you know, you're talking about six times that amount of money. So you're talking about roughly 75% would be roughly a hundred million dollars. Yeah, you know, it was so we don't have a hundred million dollars lying around to start the program tomorrow. Right. The, um, you know, but that, the other thing to keep in mind is uh, the, the costs that were projected last year, and this is again something to get more input from the administration and from Joyce on, but the costs that were projected last year, a lot of those, if I understand it correctly, are fixed costs from developing the IT system. And they would vary a little bit depending on what benefits you've got and so forth. But if you're also talking about a higher <laughs> contribution rate, uh, you may see some of that more room to absorb the, uh, those costs within the contribution rate. You're still talking about needing either a, a loan against future receipts or an appropriation to get things started. Um, but that would be the reality with anything where the state's the administrator. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you for your time. Mm. All right. And committee, I think I'm going to plow right on because we have our witness here. Um, and we are going to end right at 3 o'clock so that we can take a breather before our um, guard session tonight at 4. <laughs> and so let's let people shift in and out, and then Jessica. Representative Deanna Gonzalez from Winnie Her Representative Matt Byron, Virgins. Mary Ann Gamash from Swanton. John Kalaki, South Burlington. Lilo Bufing. Hi. Tommy Waltz from Barry City. Hi. Chip Triano from Standard. And one of our members is out injured on the disabled list, and mm -hmm. uh, and then we have a vacancy here. So uh, welcome. You are from yeah. Burlington. So please, um, you want you, you expressly asked to testify, and we'd love to hear what your story is. Great, excellent. I really appreciate this committee um, making effort to hear from Vermonters like me as you consider this bill. Um, it's really important legislation, and thank you for that. Um, so, like many women my age with young families, I work full time um, as a program manager for the state of Vermont. And I'm here on my personal time, <laughs> obviously. Um, many people assume that I get great benefits, including paid family leave, um, but that's not the case. Um, with both of my children, I had to cobble together as much um, sick leave and annual leave as I had in order to take that time to bond with my children. Um, and this time, I ended up working because that wasn't enough. Um, I didn't have enough because when you have young children, you take sick leave a lot to take care of them. Um, so I ended up working from home, which was great that my employer let me do that, um, but starting when my son was four weeks old. So um, that was a choice I felt I had to make and I, I hope that others don't in the future. Um, so. I, my husband, who works for a small private business in Burlington, he gets no sick leave or any leave, really. Um, it's a very small employer. Um, and so he, sorry, paid parental leave, he doesn't get any of that. Um, so with our son, who was born at home, um, my, my husband caught the baby, which was really exciting, at 11.09 p.m., and then he was back on the job the next day. Um, and that, was our reality this time. Last time he took a week off. So, um, and just having had two kids, and if, if any of you have had children, um, you know that a baby, when they're born, they're essentially in the fourth trimester. They're meant to be 
with their parents, with their primary caregivers, with whoever is meant to be bonding with them and caring with them um, for at least 12 weeks, probably more, <laughs> honestly. Um, but we don't have any family nearby to help uh, fill some of the holes that I'm, I'm trying to tell you about here in our lives. Um, so the burden of care, um, not that my husband doesn't try to help, but a lot of the burden of care does fall to me with our two children. Um, because I have a better sick leave policy at my job. Um, but, and I love being a mom, but the cost of becoming one is far too much to bear. Physically, mentally, emotionally, and yes, financially, parenting in America has become nearly untenable. Women do the majority of caregiving still. This is not what our foremothers imagined for us, working full time and not having the ability to take time off to bond with your baby. Um, when my mother was sick and dying in 2011, my sister and I took countless unpaid days and weeks to care for her. I will never regret a second of that time, but it left me thousands of dollars in debt. The tragedy of my 56-year-old mother dying was enough. Why did I also have to suffer financially? We must do better. Vermont can lead where others haven't, as we have with many other important issues. If we are serious about attracting families to live and work in Vermont, then I guarantee that this insurance will underscore that commitment. If people know that regardless of employer, both parents can have 12 weeks of paid leave when a child is born, that is a huge recruitment tool. It's an economic investment. I also think that this current bill reflects the bare minimum that Vermonters need, and I urge you to keep this bill as strong as possible. In the end, we need more than an insurance program. We need wraparound services to make living in Vermont possible for all families, including childcare, mental health services, increased wages, and paid family leave. I'm sure you will hear from many people about how important this bill is, and you might hear from some who think that there are other priorities, or that this will somehow cost employees and employer employers too dearly. When America is one of only two countries in the world that doesn't offer paid family leave, it's time to take a stand. We all deserve better, and we have the opportunity in Vermont to make that happen. Thank you for taking my testimony today. And I'll take any questions. <laughs> How old are your babies now? Uh, my son is about five months old next week. He'll be five months. And my daughter is going to be five years old on the 20th. So we're five five right now. <laughs> and I have 6,702 pictures of both. <laughs> <laughs> but only seven of them. Five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's better the first time. Yeah. Um, so did you? It's a hard question to do. Um, no, I thank you for sharing. Um, it, you know, so what happens to you when you talk about the stresses? I mean, being a parent is stressful enough. Um, so how did you get through that decision-making process and, and just like the next eight weeks after you were working from home for however long you were working at home? I mean, that's... Yeah. Um, did, did you keep up the, the, the baby's health stay up? Did your health stay up? Yeah, I mean... I think once you become a parent, you just just keep going. And just, like last night, my husband said to me, he's like, I don't know how you're still going. I was like, made dinner, bathing the children, and like he had been home with the baby all day, so I was trying to give him a break. But I worked all day, and that was kind of the same thing during what was supposed to be my leave time because it's not like life stopped. And I think that's the thing. I don't think most people expect life to stop, but work should stop. I think you need to be focused. On your family there are certain moments in our life and everybody not everybody experiences having children but most people experience caring for someone who's sick in your in your life unexpectedly my mom was so young I mean life kept going but work should but I had to do that's just what I had to do this time mm -hmm. in order to not have my money <laughs> Well, let just I mean, let, let's go throw it back to before you had your first baby. Mm -hmm. I mean, did any of this come across your transom? I mean, did you understand like any of this might happen? Like, um, 
man, I, I'd hit the, the golden ticket. And then the reality of it was, no, you're actually, you're still in probation. You get no leave. You have some sick leave, and you can use it all up if you want. But then you have no sick leave. And you're not accruing sick leave. And, oh, by the way, you're not going to get a paycheck. So you have to pay for your health insurance. So that, you know, it's just the reality of, you know, I think, I can't imagine an employer other than the state of Vermont where you might assume it would be a little better. Um, and, it, and it is better, that's the thing. It's better than a lot of employers, but gosh, it's not even close to the bare minimum, in my opinion. Representative Clef. I wonder what the administration's new announcement of allowing parents to bring their children to work. Will that ease this, or will this just accelerate this, <laughs> the kind of tension? I mean, I think everybody has different family experiences. Um, personally, I would never want to bring my baby to my office. I feel like it would be distracting to me. There's germs everywhere. Everyone's always sick. I, I just I can't imagine doing that. At the same time, we are so lucky to have an infant spot in our daycare. And no, not everybody does. And like, I can imagine the relief that some women must be feeling right now, and, and p parents in general, just like, oh my gosh, we don't have to think about that terrible stress for three, three more months. If you take those 12 weeks, and then you get three more months with that. So I feel like it's, it's one of those well-intentioned backwards policies that it's a Band-Aid over what you all are trying to really accomplish, which is we need paid family leave so that people can cobble together family support that works for them. And I don't know if the bill um, does this, but I would assume that two parents, if it's a two-parent household, one could take 12 weeks and then the next could take 12 weeks. That's six months of real childcare, not childcare that you have to try to do your job during at an office. Is that what you're asking? That's how I feel about it. <laughs> That's what you're asking. <laughs> Does it make an impact on where you want to live or where you might, you know, life choices that you have moving forward? I mean, certainly, I love Vermont. I love living here. We've been here permanently since 2007, and I spent several summers here before that. But I think that it is, you know, if I knew another state suddenly implemented a policy where I knew I was going to get paid family leave, and I'm done having children, by the way, <laughs> but if I wasn't done having children, or if I knew that I had a sick family member that I was going to need to care for, it would definitely be an, an additional enticement to me. It's almost like the package you wish you had with an employer is already kind of semi-constructed. Um, and then if they offer good wages, well, that's great. So I, I do, I think Vermont's already a great place to get people to try to come live. Um, I recruited my sister from Massachusetts to move here. Um, and she's going to have kids. And gosh, I hope that this exists for her. And she has this option um, in a couple of years when she makes that choice. So Is 1% an outrageous price to pay to you in your salary? No. No. I, or what does it represent? 1% of my salary represents, I tried to do the math, and I, I thought at one point it was about $70 a month or something. I don't know if it's before or after they take everything else out, um, but it feels really, it felt really doable. At the last bill, I remember doing the math. Someone would have to do the math for me now. Uh, but 1% of, I make about you know, on paper, I make 56000 a year. <laughs> but so if it's off of that, even that, I, I feel like it's not completely out of the question for something that I'm probably going to definitely use. Even though I'm done having children, I can imagine. I'm 40. My husband's 48. His parents are aging. You know, these, these things are inevitable. And I think it's a, it's a way that people can actually plan for it. And, and be caught in those moments where you feel uncaught. <laughs> Questions for Jessica? I really appreciate you coming in. I mean, like you said, it's, it, this is a um, hearing from people who are actually in the workplace now or um, 
mean, we've talked, we've all talked about the, the desire to have um, quote unquote younger people here in Vermont. And um, the picture you draw of not being able to take the time to bond or to take care of the sandwich in the sandwich generation, right? Um, it's that's what that's why we're looking at the bill. You know, I think that's really one of the realities of looking at the, at this bill and trying to figure out what the best way forward is. But thank you for sharing your share. Did you have that on electronic? Is that something you can share with us? Yeah. Um, if that's something you can send to Ron or give us a copy of that, we would appreciate that for our records. Sure. All right. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I think we can go off the record. Um, yeah, I'm done for the day.